Welcome everyone to another episode of Saving the World podcast with Luke McMichael and Martin Resney. Today we're going to be talking about Avatar 2, The Way of the Water. And uh, one of my favorite film franchises ever, I believe, Avatar has the potential to, I think, save the world. I think um, some pretty big words, some pretty big things we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll, we'll get to hear what Martin thought of the, of the movie and um, we'll share some of our perspectives on where it might go in the future and and how we can actually you know learn from it and every month we try to pick some kind of media some kind of uh uh thing we've done the expanse we've done uh, we've done the star wars and or and we've done many different things we we really think that it's a, a huge part of understanding the world around us the media the movies the games that make us who we are build our generations avatar more than anything, is one of one of the very special kind of film franchises that's really trying to zero in on problems with the environment. James Cameron being a huge environmentalist and trying to really educate people on you know what not to do if we don't want this world where we're all fighting for you know scarce resources and and killing you know Native Americans or Native tribes at whatever planets we end up going to, or even just on Earth, whatever um, you know human species or human people we. Or, or native uh, animals we, we'd be taking land from. It, these are very important concepts. And Avatar and Avatar 2 really help kind of hit home some of these concepts on you know why we should care about them and, and what we can learn from them and how we can make the world a better place by implementing some of these ideas and emotions. So that's kind of the preamble a little bit of, of what we're going to be talking about. Um, let me just give Martin a chance to kind of Say, so what, what did you think of the movie overall and, and what can we learn from it? Well, on the level of normal movie review, uh, I did quite like it. Uh, it wasn't principally super different from the first Avatar movie, but uh, I guess that's why it's now like, what, it's like the fourth most watched movie ever or third. Like, third I think uh... it displaced the Titanic. Yeah, so, so Titanic... it's the Avatar 1 Avatar... and the game Avatar 2. Yeah, number two is the um, and then Titanic. Endgame, yeah, Avatar one, Endgame, and then Titanic was third. So then it just displaced Titanic, right? So now it's number three. So we have Avatar one, Endgame, Avatar two, and then Titanic are the top four. And there's only five, I think, total. Yeah. The, the other is one is Star Wars that have grossed two more than two billion. Star Wars uh, seven grossed more than two billion. So they're yeah. So which is insane if you think about it because it's like uh, uh, on the like the very tippy top of the movies that made the most money ever it's James Cameron competing with James Cameron because uh, the only reason why it was uncertain if it's going to be number three the Avatar Way of Water was because there was a re-release of Titanic also so Titanic was increasing it, its growth as there was the new movie trying to beat it and it still did beat it even though titanic made even more money lately with the re-release so yeah. i'd say a bit insane like like it's basically whole planet of people like i don't know how many billion people but uh in like the top top five most grossing movies it's just one guy is, is basically trying to top himself and that that's it so that's a bit of a like a planetary anomaly and a definitely a, a sign that like even like a single person can have a pretty big influence overall so like in terms of like uh just like trying to save the planet i, I think that it's a very interesting uh, example of like uh, what that one guy or i guess woman could also uh just what they could what a person could do uh, if they somehow bizarrely decide that uh sorry to save the world is a priority so in terms of like the movie and, and, and what it was about of course like no spoilers we're not really going to discuss any like minute specific details i don't think uh it's just clearly about uh, there's a lot of water in the movie which is awesome uh because uh, i think uh, the reason why people main reason why people keep going to these movies and it's very clever on james cameron's part is that if you like really take the time and make the the 3d effects perfect and uh on the way like develop some new technologies of like doing special effects so that it's better than anything that anyone has seen ever before then just on this level the movie is such an experience that you can't not go watch it. Like, well, what else would you go watch instead other than the thing that's never been seen before on, on some level? Like, it doesn't even have to be a great movie. But of course, even on the level of script, I think this one is better than, than the first one, or at least the script is more interesting. But again, I don't think that uh, 
it's necessarily that the first movie had a terrible script. I think it was very deliberate. Uh, and there's a reason why, again, the whole world watched it. Because you, I don't think you can have like a super intellectual, clever script and have uh, an appeal of like the whole planet watching it. Mm-hmm. I think like in order to reach the whole planet, you need to try to meet the planet at where it's at mentally and uh, to make it translate across cultures. Like if you make it sufficiently basic in terms of story as stories go, then everybody in the world will understand it if it's like an archetypal story. Then like uh, people in India, in China, in America, in Europe, like everybody will, in Africa, everybody will watch it and will be like, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah. And it's because it's basic. Uh, so I think a similar argument is usually levied against uh, Independence Day, that like uh, or Roland, Roland Emmerich's movies. It's like, oh, it's so dumb in terms of the script. But again, everybody watched it and most of the world liked it probably because it's intentionally very basic so that everybody can identify. So I think that's part of it that's very clever and it all is connected in that it's really, I think Cameron is really not just trying to make a movie. He's like very clearly wasn't just trying to make a movie. He was trying to make something that everybody in the world will see and that will bring the at least some sort of like basic environmental message to basically everybody in the world who otherwise might have missed it, that it's important. And in the second movie in particular, again, without any specific spoilers, I think the sort of a uh, plight of not only like the native species, the native uh, like the aliens on the planet, but also of some like specific animal species mm. uh, on that planet, is like really like emotionally really well depicted. So that uh, some it's like a what was the the movie that sort of most reminded me of uh, like a so some some sort of a cynical reviewers where. Uh, talking about it like, oh, it's like uh, something that was like very hip in the 90s or whatever, when the environmentalism first began to be portrayed yeah. in movies like Free Willy or, or that whales, type yeah. of movies. Save the whales. And that's like <laughs> as if it's like stupid and outdated or whatever, or like, oh, we've solved that. Like everybody agrees that those kind of people who torment animals are bad. It's just like, yeah, but it's still more impactful if more people again are reminded that maybe it's a it's a thing that that because it's not just about that specific example that's in the movie but it's about in general approach to the environment so again like on basically every level i'm pretty sure james cameron knew perfectly what he was doing and he again succeeded at it and he topped himself i think the second movie is better than the first one and uh it's just again like a a, a proof what one person can do if they like decide like oh i'm going to affect the world to make it better it's like you can actually a single person can have like a in billions of dollars like a huge oversized impact i, I agree i agree 100 percent um i don't think we'll have many disagreements when we're talking about this this movie and i, I don't think it can be overstated how important movies like this are for humanity you know a lot of people might just laugh at it and say oh it's just a movie it's not a big deal but it is a big deal like movies basically give us something to look forward to and something to aspire to. Um, you know, I remember when I was a kid seeing Jurassic Park for the first time and, and just being so excited about that movie and about learning about dinosaurs. It just changed my whole world in, in many ways. And then, of course, all the Disney films and, and all the Star Wars films that, that I just grew up with that kind of gave me the whole desire to save the world or the desire to, I guess, be a hero. Luke Sky- I'm named after Luke Skywalker, by the way, just in case that anyone knows. <laughs> I was born in the year after the movie came out. But anyway, the point is, movies matter so much. And, and they, they make society function. And they, they, they create society. Societies merge around the media. They merge around these movies. And, and the fact that this movie is the biggest movie franchise of all time, and probably will continue, we're going to have three more, three, four, and five at least, maybe six and seven, he's saying, if it's popular. And he's going to continue building this arc um, of you know, how to build a better world and how to save a world and how, and the thing that with Avatar 2 that I found that was very interesting was the family dynamic that really didn't exist as much in the first where, where it's really about, and, and not just the basic family dynamic, but challenging what the basic family is with the adopted child that wasn't even the same race. And then, um, you know, it, well, we'll have a few spoilers, I'm sure just in talking about it, but, uh, but anyway, like uh, the way that the mother basically had this adopted earth child that was the son of the main bad guy um um and and basically ended up you know casting him out or threatening his life uh to try to save her own daughter even though you know he was kind of her adopted son it was it was very emotional in in some ways but it's also kind of 
very true when you think about mother's instinct. You think about, uh, you know, how she's going to value her kids above her blood kids, above almost anything else, even if it means, you know, killing hundreds or thousands or millions of other people. Um, it's blood first. And that, that's a very interesting topic just to kind of explore, you know, in, in this whole new environmentalist type movie in this whole different world. And I think that's a very important question we have to kind of answer is how much is a life worth? How much is a family member worth? And if you could, you know, save your family by blasting off in a spaceship and, and blowing up the whole world, how many of us would actually do that? And uh, I don't know. It's the, the interesting questions. Um, but the fact that it puts the well, question. On this level, I'm, uh, go ahead. On this level, I'm actually quite intrigued uh, in uh, where will they take it next? Because so far, the one angle that's sort of implied but wasn't explored is that maybe like the human people from planet Earth, they are on a mission to try to save Earth. They're just doing it in a way that's endangering another planet. Yeah. And so far, the humans were portrayed or framed mostly as, as pure villains. Uh, but I think like in the second movie, there's already some nuance, nuance uh, in the, again, on the theme of minor spoilers, uh, with the main bad guy who was sort of resurrected from, from, from the first movie. I think... He's not really the same, just pure villain anymore. Like he seems to have be having an arc, even yeah. though he's like very much a villain throughout the whole thing. There seems to be some sort of arc that sort of implies to me that it might be like very interesting. Uh, and uh, James Cameron said something to the extent of uh, that uh, the scripts for the future movies are where it's going to get crazy. Like it's actually going to get like uh, more, I guess, complex. Yeah. So there, it would be very interesting to see more of the human side or like planet earth side of the sort of the cataclysm on planet earth and uh yeah. the sort of motivation like or the desperation that I, comes with it because then it could be an exploration of like uh two different approaches to like saving a world or fundamentally philosophically opposed ways of fighting for your own uh future type stuff that could actually get even like for the the snooty uh, critics it could get uh, somewhat more complex and interesting on the level of script in the future i imagine uh because like at this point everybody is definitely hooked who like all of the people who watch on avatar are definitely going to watch the third one so i don't think they necessarily need to keep uh the same completely basic level of storytelling or archetypal level of storytelling yeah. to such to same extent because obviously the script for this movie was already more complex than the first one so i imagine the third one will be even more complex because there's only so much you can say in one movie but yeah. uh yeah, it's so for, for me, it's, it's definitely interesting going forward how they will address more deeper themes or issues that are, have been already foreshadowed or, or implied in there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think guess. it's not it's not beyond reason that the bad guy might end up being the savior in some way. He might pull a Darth Vader on us and, and you know, uh, <laughs> save save Pandora at some point because his son is a part of it or, or something. Right. It's, it's, it's actually very similar to Star Wars with the you know, the son being the son of the bad guy at, at the same time. It, it's, there's a lot of interesting connected arcs there that, that we've already kind of had ingrained to us growing up with the whole Star Wars arc. And now we're just seeing it in a different way and a different level with kind of the, with the nature being much, much bigger part of it. So yeah, I'm very excited. I'm very excited to see where it goes. Um, I'm very excited to see whether or not people can actually dig into the deeper meetings on, on average because it, it's at, at its core it's just a very awesome movie to watch even if you don't listen to the story at all it's still really cool to see these these whales and these dolphins and these pterodactyls kind of fly all around it's just an amazing three hours I'd, I'd never get bored you know watching that um it's it's amazing for me and so I'm very excited to just see where it goes. It's like now that you're describing it, it, it does, uh, if you think about it, it is a bit of a Jurassic Star Wars. Mm. A little bit. Is what the movie is. A little bit. It absolutely is. <laughs> Taking they, they everything do. that ever worked. Yeah. And, and those are two of the biggest films of my young life, Jurassic, Jurassic Park and Star Wars. And they've kind of put them together to now make the biggest film franchise of all time. Taking all the best things from all the best movies of the past and inspiring a whole new generation of world changing people, world saving people. Yeah, and also, also he, uh, James Cameron is, is taking all the best parts of his all of his movies. So it's it's like if you did uh, Jurassic Star Wars, but you put the best parts of Terminator in there and the best parts of uh, uh, what were his other franchises. He did, uh, I think, True Lies. He did, True and Lies, then Titanic. he did, uh, yeah. uh, and the Titanic, obviously, because it's still a romance and there's a lot of water and stuff. So like basically, you take everything 
like the underwater stuff, this like action stuff, the family dynamic, the strong female, but the actual strong female character that's completely earned, as he like, usually has in his movies, yeah. like in uh, Sigourney Weaver in Aliens or uh, or uh, Sarah Connor in the Terminator franchise, because Neytiri is very much that kind of character, like a badass female character that's completely justified. Uh, which is not always the case in, in movies that try to have like a strong female character. Like somehow James Cameron is like expert at it, and every time he did it, it's excellent. And all of the female characters that he does yeah. or creates in the movies are excellent. So it's like all of these like best parts of most of the best movies yeah. of, of uh, the recent like the last several decades. <laughs> and uh, and it's just it's just really I think it really works. And I really don't at this point I really don't understand like the cynical critics who are, would still be focusing on like nitpicking some like details that they don't like about it because like especially in retrospect it's like it's those people who were like uh, oh who cares about avatar it's been like i don't know how many years and but then it's like contrasted it's like always it's always wrong like if they make a movie like a marvel movie on schedule in like every two years they have to make a sequel and it suffers the effect suffer the production suffers because it's done very quickly then well that's bad and they're stupid because they're doing it like uh, with not enough time devoted to the effects and stuff and if yeah. somebody tries, okay, so let's do 11, 12 years until it's finished, then like it's bad again, but it's bad because, uh, oh, who cares? Like after such a long time, who would even want to watch the sequel and stuff? It's like, sometimes like you, you can't win. It's just like, whatever you do is wrong. Like if, if you did like a complex script, it would be wrong because it's complex. If you do a simple script, it's wrong because it's simple. If you do a lot of effects, then it's bad because you did a lot of effects. If it's like, you don't do enough effects, yeah. Uh, then it's bad because like there should have been more of a spectacle. So it's like sometimes it feels like criticizing for the sake of criticizing. Yeah, it, it, haters will be haters at the end of the day. That's their job. It's all about nitpicking. They get attention by nitpicking on on the small things. And even my son was like that to some of that. You know, snobs, movie snobs in some in some in some cases. They're just always looking to nitpick everything just to be kind of controversial and try to say my opinion is the right one and this is why, <laughs> and whatever it is they have to say. But all that being said, it's made you know more money than, than it needs to get all of the f future films produced. So there's really no arguing against the fact that it's it's good. It's a good idea. The world needs this right now. And um, it's just a question of how big is it going to be and how world-changing or world-saving is it actually going to be. That's, that's the question in my mind. It's not whether it's successful or not, whether it's a great movie or not. Those things are all you know, decided whether you want to be a critic or not. It's decided that it's a great movie. James Cameron will go down in history as the greatest filmmaker of all time, in my opinion. Um, well, in his words, the king of the world still again. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to meet him someday. It's definitely he's got this interesting, you know, I've, I've, I've heard things that he he was in that. Um, what was it? The one documentary about uh, future future man where they kind of made fun of him, uh, you know, running the world 20 years in the future. He was the king of everything, but he was a really bad guy. He had AI slave that was kind of running his household and, and they were trying to free the AI slave from his tyranny. But it was kind of kind of funny to think about. But I imagine he's a pretty down to earth guy at the end of the day. Who knows? Uh, but I imagine the fact that he's made such well, a great masterpiece, it'd be, uh, you know. Well, based on what bad. I've heard, like he's one of those people who's uh, very, uh, very ambitious and demanding. But yeah. uh like, I guess not to a point where he would be like, a, I don't know, like a, a criminally abusive or anything. Uh, that's, I think, other creators. Uh, like recently, have you noticed uh, Rick and Morty, uh, principal voice actor? Apparently, he's some sort of abuse abuser criminal. Oh, so I didn't, I didn't know that. he was axed. No, uh, Justin Roiland. Wow. So I guess like it could be could, like that's what's really bad. Uh, but I guess in that particular case, if you think about the characters of Rick and Morty and then the person voicing them being some sort of a problematic person, it's probably not the most surprising revelation ever. Yeah. Uh, it just seems to be true to character. Well, but uh, in, in, case, in case of Cameron, it's definitely nothing, nothing like bad to that extent, but uh, it might be difficult to... Like it's one of those directors that's like very tough on, on the actors and really, really requires excellence. Like uh, I think similar repetition uh, was ascribed to what's his name Kubrick. Hmm. I think it's like one of those directors. But then like it shows in the in what they produce that it does have some fundamental level of excellence. Yeah. And in the, in the case of Cameron, the actors do seem to return. Like like if the actors who were with him on previous movies, like Sigourney Weaver, keep returning, then it's it's probably just. Uh, a demanding relationship and not like yeah. a problematic relationship there's definitely got to be respect there and and you know he, he has to earn the respect and 
So, yeah, uh, let's just hope the power doesn't uh, go to his head too much. That the power, you know, power <laughs> does have the tendency to corrupt. If he is going to be the king of the of the film world and potentially the king of the actual well, world at some point. <laughs> well, like, uh, imagine if, like, if he's if he's like the three se- Avatar sequels, or each make over two billion dollars, then he might actually be voted the the king of the world or something. Yeah, if uh, it, you know, be hilarious is if he ran for president or, or something like that at some point in the future. <laughs> like he could, you never know. Like it's interesting to think of where he might go from this. I mean, he's already kind of getting a little older, so I'm not sure what his last act will be, but. Whether he, his whole career kind of finishes with Avatar or if he has anything else planned. But at the end of the day, I, I'm very happy with, with what he's done. And I think his contribution to saving the world is undeniably huge. Um, and, and No, like uh, I actually wrote a, recently wrote an article with some of my thoughts about it does seem to be a bit of a new trend in movies that I do like. And sort of my theory is that sort of new biggest blockbuster formula, like in the previous period, which I think just about ended uh, with the end of phase one of, uh, of uh, or like end of, I guess, end, end of the end game, like Marvel cycle. I think that was like a whole cycle where the big idea was uh, building the franchise, building the story multiverse. And I think that sort of played itself out. And, and for some reason it's not really working as well anymore. Even though like I've seen the Ant-Man, recent Ant-Man movie, and I liked it. It was nothing bad about it specifically. Like it was well acted, well produced, well filmed, whatever. Mm. But uh, I think the whole concept seems to be played out. And that's what I don't think it was. I think that's why it wasn't very well received. And I think the new thing, like if you watch the new most successful, last two most successful movies, it was Top Gun Maverick and uh, the Avatar sequel. And uh, like vastly more successful than anything else. And I think the reason is that uh, the people making those movies uh, are basically trying to be like real world superheroes. They like people who are trying to do something actually interesting for real while making the movie. Right. Like uh, in the case uh, case of James Cameron, it is like he's really he's done some underwater explorations. He I think might even have some re- actual record in deep water diving. Uh, that that in in, in a, like a submersible man submersible. And uh, even for like a Titanic, it's like a romantic movie about Titanic. He actually filmed the ship at the bot- on the bottom of the ocean. It's like the kind of person who is really trying to do like, actual exploration of, of the planet, who's developing real technologies that that are moving the whole like uh, whole cinema f- like further into the future. So it's like developing technology. Uh, Tom Cruise is an interesting example also because even though it's not environmentalist at all, it's like that's not the angle or at, 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 like whatsoever. Like his whole thing is like he's actually doing the stunts himself, and he's also in the same way pushing uh, the technology of filmmaking mm. while doing the film. Like because like uh, in Top Gun Maverick, they did figure out a way how to basically film themselves, the actors in actual jets, and that's why it sort of adds like a new level of realism to to the whole thing. Uh, that uh, if you if you think about it, it's just uh, it's no longer enough because like special effects are so basically commonplace and cheap and uh, like just a cgi generated effect by themselves that you're not getting any extra points of interest for those like uh, unless you do something extra specific that like it's impressive in real life mm-hmm. and if, if this trend uh if this trend keeps up and more filmmakers are inspired in the same way then i think it could like overall as like a m- new cinema movement for like maybe the next 20 years it could actually do some like real good and, and and like try to it could result in some consequences that might be actually helpful for the world because if you're doing a movie just to make money or like just to make a, a, a build a complete fantasy escapist fiction that doesn't tie into anything which as much as i like superhero genre it's kind of the most escapist in that it's trying very hard not to be real in like a realistic specifically about connected to like it's exploring a multiverse of, of worlds that aren't this one It's like very specifically keeping distance from from realism as a concept hmm. so i think the realism might be coming back okay and if it's uh, spearheaded by somebody like cameron then it might be trying to actually help things in the real world as part of making the movie being a draw for for people to go watch the movie absolutely i love it so I have one kind of controversial question to throw out there before we uh, move towards oh. wrapping it up about about this movie. Um, and uh, it really comes down to what, what I thought was really interesting about the second movie is the, the resource they're kind of going for. So the first movie was all about the unobtainium. Oh. 
Um, you know, they're willing to destroy. They, they, they wanted to be safe to the natives. They wanted to kind of her, 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 move them away where they could. They didn't want to kill them senselessly. So they were kind of being nice. But, but they, and the goal, they wanted this unobtainium, $80 million a kilo or whatever it was. And, and we assume that they used that for some kind of energy or maybe, maybe space travel or, or something. It didn't explain it. But uh, I it's, think it's uh, somewhere in the additional materials. It's explained that for the ships that they used to fly in space for the antimatter reaction, they needed to know. Yeah, so it's some kind of massive energy that they that they got. So it made sense. They they needed this material that was only available on Pandora, and it was their new gold, right? It was the new gold rush. So in the second one, they expanded that even more to be the um, the the new gold was actually the serum, which again. Spoilers anyway, but uh, it's, it's the serum inside of the whale, like, uh, you know, intelligent species that was communicating with the, the sea people. And by drilling into the skull of these whales and extracting the serum, they're able to actually extend human life, which I thought was, again, a very interesting concept that in some ways it kind of, you know, if you could do that, that would be extremely valuable. $80 million for this little vial of serum from, you know, killing this one whale. And... Um, and then, so the question in my mind, you know, immediately pops up is how much is, you know, life worth? And it, it becomes a bit of a trolley problem, doesn't it? Where like, say, imagine you could save a million humans back on earth or extend their lives by a hundred years or even, even a decade um, by giving them, you know, one millimeter of, of the serum or, or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty debatable. Like how many monkeys do we kill to, to have vaccines or how many, you know, dolphins or, or whatever do we test on to save millions and millions of humans li uh, lives? So is that ethical, I guess, is the real question. And at what point is it ethical, you know, to kill a life form of some kind or a, a dolphin or a whale if it means, you know, saving or extending the lives of, of hundreds or thousands or millions of humans? What, what do you think about that? What is, what, what is that question? How does that resonate with you? Yeah, th th thanks for the easy softball question. Uh, yeah, uh, in this case, it's, it's really it is a very complicated philosophical moral thing. I guess if you watch the movie, you're definitely going to be on the side of the whale. Mm. Like if you put it into a personal context, then 100 percent, you're not going to care about some hypothetical other people that you will save by basically committing what to you is a is an atrocity personally on an emotional level yeah so the the movie can't really is not interested in presenting any <laughs> anything else or like i said <laughs> maybe in a future movie more of the human perspective will be in there but of course it's a valid question because it's it, there is uh, medical research being done uh, or many like uh uh medicines but even cosmetics being tested on animals and like my personal position is that uh like at the very least, you shouldn't be doing it for something basically frivolous, like like cosmetics. Like that, I think like you only start having an argument if it's for something that is saving lives. Mm. And then within that, I still think you really need to be thinking very hard about it, even if you want to like justify it at all. Like uh, this was this whole thing with uh, Fauci overseeing some sort of research where they were basically torturing puppies. Mm for not even any solid medical benefits like uh, of the research on the level of design of the research. So I'm also like, it's not just okay because it's medical research technically. Uh, like, I don't think like uh, torturing puppies on principle is something that you should be doing unless like super extremely sure that it's like absolutely necessary to prevent people from dying. Like maybe to even start having the argument. And once you start having the argument, then I'm personally not super big fan of this like, uh, the trolley solution, trolley problem solutions where, oh, it's always 100% justified if it's more people that you save necessarily. I'm a, a, an individualist philosophically. And uh, as an individualist, I think ethics are more about like personal moral intuitions more than about uh, necessarily the math of like uh, strict consequences. But of course, that's the choice. It's, it's not resolvable. In like philosophy, there's good arguments for moral consequentialism, and there's good arguments for sort of moral intuition mm. being the more the, the better guiding principle in that sense. And I think my sort of favorite uh, sci-fi uh, discussion of it was actually in Babylon Five, where there was one episode where there was like a villain who developed anti-aging serum, but it was very similar in that the anti-aging serum required to like for one sentient being to kill another sentient being to, to get, get, gather the resource necessary for creating it. Mm -hmm. So basically would guarantee constant war 
uh, of like, well, some people would probably be immortal in that scenario, but it's sort of like a changes the world or the universe in that sense uh, as a whole in such a way that maybe it's not worth it. And like the solution, some spoilers for Babylon 5, was nobody going to watch. Uh, there was one super advanced alien race that normally didn't, Vorlons, that didn't normally intervene in the affairs of the like less advanced races. But in this case, once uh, this uh, villain person, she presented that she has this cure and was basically released from the Babylon 5 station to go into the universe to, well, sow chaos with it. Uh, the Vorlon ship appeared and uh, it basically blasted the ship to smithereens, like killing that villain. Uh, with the explanation, because the Vorlons basically did figure it out. Like, Vorlons basically were immortal technologically, as everybody suspected. So they basically told, like, did that, like, killed the villain and destroyed the serum and told everybody else, like, you're not ready for immortality. Yeah. Hmm. Type stuff. So, so maybe, maybe you should really try to work hard to make that as, like, unnecessary as possible. Like, the, like either develop a technology that it doesn't fundamentally require to be committing immortal acts uh, for the greater good. Uh, and in the absence of that, maybe death is the part of the plan. And uh, you, maybe it's more about like how you live the life, the time that you have, than trying to like uh, do whatever it takes to be alive a little bit longer. Yeah. But that's mostly my perspective. No, thank you. And again, these are really tough, almost unanswerable questions. Everyone has their own opinion on, you know, what a life is worth, what a, a year of life is worth, what a, you know, and uh, it's it's really tough. I, I just like to kind of throw them out there because I think most people don't even see that as, as an argument. Like you said, you watch that, you're always in the whale side. But I thought, wow, you know, I can understand why they would want that. You know, if you're going to be saving your grandmother or, or saving somebody, somebody's life, then it's you know arguably more more valuable than a whale on a distant world um but then it, you get kind of get into the concept as well as, as sentience you know is, is sentient life more valuable than you know, like a you know non-sentient life and then we kind of get into all the arguments is what is sentience and and then of course we get into the artificial intelligence arguments as well so i do think that movies like this can help us come to perspective on what is you know moral and not moral what is ethical and not ethical and, and it kind of at least help inspire us to do it the right way and to kind of ask these questions before you know the questions need to be answered and to at least think about them and be prepared to answer those questions when yeah so done. just to to return the favor i have one totally softball question for you uh wh what do you think about the fact that uh some maybe many uh native americans or some representatives of native people weren't pleased with uh, james cameron telling uh like a story of the natives uh on the basis of an argument like it's not his place of like a white man to it's, be doing this sort of no, that's commentary another great, or storytelling. That's another great question. And it's cultural appropriation, right, is, is, the, is the term. And he's essentially making billions of dollars by appropriating the native story. And it's, it's, that's a good question. I personally think, you know, it's, it's good for the natives that it's good to tell their story more and that they should be happy. You know, personally, that's my opinion, is that anything that tells the native story in a kind of a, a better, you know, maybe it's not 100% accurate from their perspective. And, you know, maybe there's some criticisms for how he did it. But I think anything that spreads the story of let's value natives, let's value the native story, and let's learn more about the native story in different sci-fi sci type ways, I think they should be, you know, with open arms accepting them as, a, you know, someone who's pushing their agenda or pushing their story, at least in, in a, I think a pretty awesome way. So I, yeah, I would definitely question anyone who says anything negative about the cultural appropriation side of things and say, what's your real motive there? You know, you're actually profiting from the story being out there and, and from people valuing the native culture more because of this story. Um, I can't see anybody valuing native culture less because of this story. That's for sure. So, you know, I would definitely turn it back on them and say, you're better off with the story out there and you should be thanking him rather than, uh, you know, being angry at him for, for profiting off of it. That's about, again, yeah, my opinion. Like spoken <laughs> like a true, yeah. Sp spoken like a true cis white male. Yes. Uh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just, it's a, uh, this whole thing is, uh, no, I, I'm actually with you on that. Uh, I think in this particular case, sort of consequences matter of it more than, uh, somebody feeling that it wasn't done in the right way 
for ultimately subjective reasons in this case. It's not that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, accuse some of these like representatives of some natives people to native peoples to sort of not like it for some sort of ulterior motives. I think they might just not like it because they genuinely believe that it's not the place yeah. of somebody else to try to speak for them. And that, I think that's a justified stance, but I ultimately do agree that uh, I think James Cameron is not primarily doing it to make all that money. It's just like, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a story favoring the natives because that's the right dollar that's going to make me the most money. Like uh, that logic doesn't follow. Like uh, mm -hmm. that can only make the movie theoretically more annoying to mainstream audiences and it's a bit of a risk actually to take uh and uh in that case uh he's doing it despite the fact that it might turn some people away mm -hmm. because he thinks he I, I believe james cameron does think that it is important to tell that story and uh again maybe maybe it's just an out of touch you know white millionaire successful person who doesn't really know what he's talking about but then again like just by judging the movies on their own merit like the, the the even like the first movie, some people actually criticized it for like oh it's the old tired white savior trope mm -hmm. type stuff. But I, I've seen some sort of reanalysis like lately, like after the second movie come came out and was actually good. Uh, more people came out who were like, but actually I liked the first movie. It's just like who maybe didn't necessarily want to say it publicly because everybody would be criticizing them. Uh, so some of those like movie reviewers like did have sort of more nuanced I think reviews of the first mm -hmm. movie or re-reviews I guess of the first movie retrospectives and uh, one of those was that like if you really think about it it's not like a, the by the book traditional white savior story like it's it, they are not like the native people are not saved by the whiteness of the protagonist or the maleness of the protagonist uh, the the protagonist is saved by learning the ways of the native people. Is, is actually more what's happening in, in that like script as it's being written and as it's being acted, yeah, uh, if, if you actually pay attention. So it's not just like a, the hero is a, a human man who comes to the natives and thanks to him, they win. It, it's, it's more about like a, a lost person from a bad culture uh, learning how to be a better person. Yeah. It, it's, it's really more like, uh, I, I would say how I read it when I watched it. And I think, I guess, more what James Cameron intended, as far as I can be sort of deciphered from how it's specifically done. And in, in the second movie, it's even moving further away from like, I guess somebody else could criticize it uh, because everything's about also sort of these gender things now. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's interesting that it's, it's actually been a while since there was a character who was like a, just a normal straight male dad like like a traditional dad character as like the hero of the story in a traditional family unit. Mm. And uh, some people would also see it as like a, like the sort of focus on it negatively as like a negative because it's like, oh, it's a tired old, you know, some sort of gender stereotype or whatever. But also there's this sort of counter take uh, from the other side politically, which is, uh, well, maybe it's part of it why it's so successful because this is just like the normal human story that most people resonate with just statistically and uh it's a reason why these kinds of movies used to be successful uh is because it's just the basic human story is mm -hmm. this one and if you're doing uh it's like not bad if you're like try to you show alternative viewpoints on family or alternative viewpoints on gender necessarily but uh those are minority views like, like if you're trying to reach again, if you're trying to reach the vast majority of people on the planet, then you kind of have to do it by doing the default. Yeah. So again, it's sort of like again necessary part of the whole strategy, possibly. Or at least like these are the also perspectives around the movie. It's also interesting how kind of the the rebel children are kind of the ones that save the day, right? Because they don't listen to their parents, you know, and and uh, they kind of do things even though their parents say, "Be safe, be safe." The only reason they were able to save themselves is because they kind of recruited the whale and and uh, connected with Awa in, in, a, in a way that was able to save the whole family, right? So if they would listen to their parents, they'd all be dead. And you know, because they're rebellious kids, kind of living life in a different way, going about things differently, being controversial, they're able to find a, a solution to all their problems. So, you know, maybe we can save our world in, in a similar way by doing things a little different than our parents did and, and finding new solutions to things. Yeah, well, well it seems if you put it like this it does also seem very intentional on the james cameron part it's like uh that's the, who's the mess who the message is for uh is really the next generation it makes sense but also it's a bit of a like a basic setting in a 
most young adult fiction is that adults are useless and wrong <laughs> and it's the young protagonists who are supposed to actually solve problems yep. like save the world from a dystopian state created yes. by the adults so i think that's just one of the tropes that fits very nicely uh, in this kind of story absolutely okay i think uh, we've said a lot and you know i got i think i got all my uh, comments and ideas out there I, I can't speak highly enough of this movie two thumbs up Please watch it if you haven't already. So, so, so maybe, maybe I still feel like I need to ask you. So, what do you think was not great about it? Like, do you, can you think of any flaws? Some things executed badly, bad ideas. Really, not not a lot. I mean, I was pretty much defending it against anybody, who, any of the cynics, like so we talked about here. There, there's definitely cynical things, and I understand their perspective. You know, I understand they wanted deeper, or they maybe wanted, you know. Um, more to it, more to the story. And I do think he's, he's building on that. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where the AWA connection goes, you know, how this whole kind of savior complex of the, of the daughter, the daughter is the savior all of a sudden. We have a female savior, essentially daughter, who's almost going to be a godlike being connecting to this planet. That's a very interesting concept that I don't think has ever really been done on this level before, but not, definitely not in something this big. So I'm very interested to see where that goes and where he's going to take it in, into three, four, and five. And I do think he is going back to Earth. I think in five they're going back to Earth is what I heard. Maybe you'll see some of Earth before that to kind of again get the different perspectives. So yeah, anything that maybe can be... they're going to save Earth. Well, I, ideally, yeah, ideally they're they're going to connect both planets together. I mean, they're they're bringing humans to Pandora. They'll be taking Navi back to Earth at some point, I think, and and seeing how the worlds can can kind of unite potentially unite in harmony. So I think there's definitely a, a lot of room to grow and a lot of story to be told. So I do think that this was just building. This was just kind of touching the stage on all those stories. So even though it didn't finish a lot, it's intentionally not finishing a lot. So, so I don't think that was bad, even though I understand why people were not satisfied because it didn't really finish the story and it was a very basic kind of family storyline. So, uh, but I think, it, like you said, it's part of the plan. Um, and we're going to see a lot more, you know, developing story-wise in the next few episodes. I think he's going to dig deeper. So, yeah, as, as far as negative stuff, I really don't have personally have anything negative to say, I don't think. And, um, sometimes it is nice to get the perspectives, but, but I was just a huge fan. It's definitely one of my favorite franchises now, you know, all-time favorites. And it's, I'm going to be looking forward to every single movie. I'll be going to see it the first week they come out for sure with as many people as want to go with me. And it will be an event. Something I'll look forward to for the next six, seven, eight years as they keep coming out. Um, so, again, I can't can't say enough good stuff. Uh, I think it's amazing, and I, I think we need more movies like this. You know, we need to really explore the saving the world perspectives. And I, I imagine, you know, another fun thing to think about with the with the three D graphics. These movies cost so much three hundred, four hundred, four hundred fifty million. I think was this movie. In order to even break even, they have to make two billion dollars because of all the overhead and all the other people that are getting a piece of the pie, right? So it is very hard to make a movie like this that's actually going to be profitable. So I'm, I'm really excited for a day, maybe 10 or 20 years from now, when AI can kind of make movies like this cheaper to make. Maybe you can make a, an awesome, you know, visual movie based on artificial intelligence um, graphics like you have in your background there um, that could tell many more stories like this on you know a cheaper budget and and we, we can kind of start whole new genres of world changing movies like this and so that's really what I'm hoping this is kicks kicks off a whole new generation of of awesome inspiring saving the world type movies that can inspire our generation and future generations to to do better <laughs>